Uh, bonjour, hello. Uh, I'm here to talk about some work we're doing uh, using a photographic method to map obstructions exterior to a building. Uh, first, some background. Um, I'm going to rush through this to try to keep on time, but um, you know, we've heard a lot today about the benefits of daylight and, and uh, people want daylight in their buildings. Uh, employees want to work in buildings with, with daylight. People want to live in homes with daylight. Um, most of our buildings use manual shading to protect against glare and discomfort, um, and humans are terrible at controlling their manual shades. Um, we're, well, actually, we're only half terrible. We're good at uh, lowering the shade when we experience glare, but we're not good at raising the shade when that glare goes away. So what happens is that uh, shades go down and they stay down, daylight is squandered, and views are blocked. Uh, so the answer is uh, automated controls for our, for our shading systems. Um, the tr and, and that's actually becoming much more common on uh, large buildings, high spec buildings, um, but smaller buildings and residences are still kind of left out of automation. Um, part of the reason is that automation needs to be cost effective at, at that scale, right? So the uh, system costs, like the centralized control hardware, the um, commissioning, uh, sensors on the roof, that might be absorbed easily by a building that has a thousand windows, but a building that has 10 windows can absorb those costs. Uh, the other thing is that automation needs to do the right thing pretty much all the time. Uh, so um, if we were to aim for a 95% correct rate, which I, I think you know, is a pretty high bar, like that's not, that's not easy to do, we're still wrong for two hours of the work week, right? And, and occupants vividly remember the time that the shading system is not doing the right thing. Uh, so we need to get closer to 99.5, maybe 99.8 or 99.9% in the view of the occupants so that they'll be satisfied with the control. Um, so I'm here to talk about one thing that needs to be done right, and, and that's that we should not activate the shading when the window is in a shadow. Um, so that's what photographic obstruction mapping is about. It's about doing that one thing better and doing it at an, uh, economically so that it can be used on small buildings. Um, so we've heard about obstructions from some of the previous presenters, um, but they're essentially objects exterior to the building that can cast shadow on the windows. Uh, neighboring buildings is a common one. Uh, static shading devices attached to the building, like overhangs or fins, can, can cast shadows on the windows. Um, uh, David gave a good example if you're in Innsbruck. Um, topography, like mountains and hills, can cast shadows on your windows, uh, or in, in Boulder, like, like Zach had an example of. Um, and Zach also mentioned trees. It's important to model the effect of trees in daylight, and it's uh, important to account for that in, in um, the control of our shading. Uh, maybe we need a seasonal filter for the trees uh, if they, they are deciduous. Uh, so currently, most automated shading control systems can account for exterior geometry. What they do is they build a CAD model of the building and, and the site, and then they ray trace from the windows to the site. Um, the, the trouble with this is that setting up the CAD model, um, verifying that it's accurate can, can add a lot of, it can cost money and add a lot of time to the project. Uh, CAD model availability is also spotty. Um, you have, for, for major cities like Paris, there's probably a good CAD model of most of the city. For small to medium sized cities, there's a much lower availability and, and oftentimes all you have is the footprint of the building and so you have to estimate the heights and extrude the building up. Um, so any error in alignment or or um, you know, the height that you use for the exterior buildings or the shape of the roof even gets baked into the, the schedule that's produced for, for when the, the window is in shadow or not. And that, that can be difficult to, um, to diagnose and correct after the fact. Uh, so none of this is insurmountable. It's just it all adds additional cost to the project, uh, which isn't able to be borne by, by the smaller projects. Uh, so the way photographic obstruction mapping works is essentially you use a, a camera to collect the information of obstructions exterior to the window. Um, they're remapped to uh, angular pixel coordinates. Then you can simply trace the area of the sky that's visible. Um, and then you can query that, that from uh, using sun positions in real time so you know when the window is in shadow and did not. And I'll go into all this in, in more detail. Um, so to to do this, we developed a prototype camera based on the Raspberry Pi system. Uh, it has a 180 degree fisheye lens, so you can get a full view um, left to right and, and from sky to ground. Um, and it has a black shroud around it. And that black shroud allows you to hold the camera against the window um, so that it's aligned in the, the plane of the window um, 
so that it's, uh, the lens is very close to the glass. Um, and the black color reduces reflection, so you get a clearer image. Uh, one thing is that holding the camera against the window, it's nearly impossible to hold it exactly level. So we add an accelerometer that can measure the angle. Um, and on the right of the image, the right of the slide here, I have an image where I purposely held it pretty poorly. Um, and so then we can, you can take the angle from the accelerometer and then correct it by, by rotating the image properly. Uh, the next thing to look at is the angular distortion of the lens. So every, no lens is perfect. Every lens is going to have some error in it. And so it's important to correct for that. So what we do is we have a light source. And uh, we put the camera on a separate motor. And we step the camera through every few degrees and take a picture. And then we can characterize that angular distortion um, and then correct for it. So this lens, it was a $25 lens, and it's pretty good. It only had an error of like maximum about 4 degrees over, over its field of view. Um, so on the right is the uncorrected image. And when I hit the button, you see the corrected image. So there's just a little bit of a, of a you know, wobble um, to, to correct for those angles. Uh, so the uh, projection that we're using for our maps is what, what we're calling an orthonormal pseudo-cylindrical pseudo projection. Um, on the x-axis, it has azimuth angle. And on the y-axis, it has profile angle. And the benefit of using this projection is that lines that are orthonormal to the field of view are straight in the projected image. Um, and it turns out that a lot of the built environment is, is orthogonal, so that, that can be a helpful feature. Uh, so to demonstrate that, I have a couple of renderings of a cube with grids on the faces. On the left, you see the equirectangular projection, um, which is commonly used in VR. So they're, they're seeing a lot of those over in the next session over. Um, and the, the vertical lines in the equirectangular are, are straight, but the horizontal lines are all curved. On the right is the orthonormal projection, and you can see both the horizontal and vertical lines are straight. Um, so this uh, shows the reprojection. Uh, so first we have a, a hemispherical fisheye, and then when I reproject it, um, you can see the top edge of the overhang above the window is straight, which is very pleasant. And helpful, actually, as we'll see later on. Uh, com in comparison, the equirectangular, the front edge of that overhang is not straight, so it's, it's actually quite awkward. Um, so now that we've reprojected it, what we want to do is trace our visible sky. And it's a lot easier to trace those straight lines on the horizontals and vertical. And, and those are sometimes the most important lines. Um, and once we've traced this, then we essentially have an obstruction map that we can query re in real time with our control system to know when a window is in shade or not. Um, and th so this shows the sun path through a year. And you know we can query it at hours. We can query it every minute. We can query it in 30 seconds, essentially. Uh, so to validate this, um, we wanted to look at the sun shining on the window. Um, it's actually difficult to see sun shining on glass. So I took a page out of John Martelievich's book and put paper over the window. And that allows you to see the sun shining on the window, where it's on the window and, and when it stops shining on the window. And then I took a picture every, every minute. Um, and so this is the time lapse animation of that picture. And so you can see the sun started shining on the window. The shadow of the tree is moving across the window as the sun moves. Um, and then as the sun goes above the overhang, you'll see that shadow line move down the window uh, progressively. And then it'll get to the point where this, the window is no longer in the sun. Um, so we can compare the times from the time lapse animation to the predicted time using calculated sun position and the obstruction map. Um, and uh, the actual time that the sun began to shine on the top of the window was 7 min uh, 7.42 in the morning. Uh, the time predicted was 7.39. So we had an error of about three minutes. And that's a, about a 0.4 degree angular error between the top edge of the window and the f top of the adjacent building. The sun stopped shining on the window at 11.03. And we predicted it to happen at 11.06. So again, it's about three minutes. Um, and that's a 0.7 degree uh, angular error between the bottom edge of the window and the uh, front edge of the overhang. Um, so in summary, uh, a calibrated camera can be used to generate angular maps of obstructions. Um, the maps are thought to be accurate within one degree, though there's more validation that's ongoing that needs to be done. We need to essentially test sun positions in a wider area over the, the, uh, the map. Um, and at about five minutes per, um, per obstruction map, 
this method is economical for small projects. So if you have 10 windows, you can, you can do this fairly easily. It might be a little bit tedious for large projects, so in, in that case, you might use it to validate um, a ray traced map in, in situ after, after a building's built. Um, so I also have some examples. Uh, so this is an example from the hotel that I'm staying in, actually, this week. Um, I, I have a room that looks out into a, essentially a courtyard. So I take four photos on the window in, in different corners, so I get a, a good, good coverage. Um, and then I remap those and merge them into the orthonormal format. And then I can trace around them. Um, and then I can over, overlay sun path to, to see like when and what time of year the, the shadow will be um, cast onto the window. Um, and then this is essentially the map that's uploaded into a control system to control a shade or a blind or an electrochromic window. Um, another one is a New York City uh, office building. There it is reprojected, traced, and then with the sun path, and then that's the map. And then I think I have one more. Yeah, so this is a Los Angeles office building. Um, you can tell it's LA because they've got a roof pool, they've got not a cloud in the sky, and then a, a band of smog along the horizon. Um, so two, two images, one from each side of the window, reprojected, traced, and then um, a sun path overlay. And then this is the map, the map. And for this one, we had to use a full map. Uh, so we call them half maps and full maps. The facade here uh, was angled back by about two degrees. So now the horizon is below halfway down the window. So for, for skylights or, or um, windows that are angled backwards, we use a full square map, whereas for the vertical or ones that are angled down, we can just use a half map. Um, so thank you for, for coming. Thank you for listening. <laughs>